I'm here with Alexander McCurse, Editor-in-Chief of the Duran. Alexander, let's talk about Turkey and Cyprus. And I think this is going to be an interesting video because uh, we're both Greek and um, Greek Cypriot. And so, you know, we'll see if we can tackle this subject in an objective manner. So let's uh, let's give it a shot. And uh, the news is if people aren't following this story, it's actually a really interesting story and and a really important story. Um, If people don't know, Israel, Egypt, Cyprus and Greece are working together to develop the natural gas reserves in the Mediterranean, stretching all the way to, towards the Aegean. And uh, you have Cyprus, of course, which has been divided since 1974. You have the Republic of Cyprus, which is the recognized uh, Republic of Cyprus, which lies in the south of the, of the island. And in the north is the occupied north. It is currently recognized only by Turkey. And that is uh, considered an occupied territory. And um, you have now Erdogan, who is moving Turkish ships to also explore for natural gas and, uh, and oil reserves, 200 miles all the way down towards the, the, the EEZ, the exclusive economic zone of Cyprus, all the way down south, even stretching all the way towards Greek waters, and those ships are moving in those directions to explore for natural gas in, uh, in those areas. And recently you had the British, correct me if I'm wrong, he is the foreign uh, minister? Yes, he's the deputy foreign deputy minister. Deputy foreign minister, yeah. correct. Uh, Alan Duncan, I believe mm-hmm. is his name, yeah. who said that uh, those areas, that water is disputed when in fact it is recognized as the uh, exclusive economic zone of the Republic of Cyprus. And so, Alexander, you have uh, a lot of different countries, a lot of different forces operating in this area. I should also note that you have Exxon Mobil there. You have uh, Francis Total. Um, You have a lot of big oil companies who are who are uh, exploring natural gas reserves in that area. And here comes Erdogan in Turkey and the Turkish ships kind of moving into that territory. So what's going on here? Well, this is an extraordinarily interesting and important story, and it's not getting as much coverage as it should be getting, in my opinion, because it's having happening in a very sensitive part of the world. Now, let, let's just clarify the legal, the international legal position. The uh, um, exclusive economic zones are part of international uh, um, maritime law, about the law of the sea which is partly a creature of international treaty, partly a creature of uh, court decisions, but it is very well established. Um, um, This area where these Turkish ships, these Turkish ships which are carrying out drilling um, in order supposedly to research uh, whether there's gas or oil there, um, these Turkish ships are definitely in Cyprus's internationally recognized exclusive economic zone. I say that because, of course, internationally, Cyprus is a united island. It is is, the the internationally recognized government of Cyprus is the government of Nicosia and the international community. This is the entire international community recognizes only one government in Cyprus, which is the one in Nicosia and only one economic zone for Cyprus, which is the one that Cyprus is claiming. When the British talk about contested seas, they are talking nonsense in legal terms. I, I want to make all that very clear because we need to get all that straight out straight. Now, these are legal terms. This is, this is these factual are, these are, legal these are terms. These are factual legal terms. I mean, if this case were ever to go, to the international court in The Hague, there is no question at all who would be on the winning side. The, the, the Cyprus would unequivocally win this case. Now, of course, Erdogan and the Turkish government that he leads do not recognize uh, um, um, that Cyprus is you know, a single country. They recognize this, uh, uh, this northern entity in northern Cyprus which was created in northern Cyprus following a Turkish invasion of the island in 1974, an invasion in which your family 
was uh, directly affected and of which I believe you have personal memories. And he does not recognize, as a consequence of this, Erdogan doesn't recognize um, Cyprus's exclusive economic zone, though everyone else does. And he claims, on the strength of Turkey's continental shelf, a extremely inflated exclusive economic zone for Turkey, which in some places would extend all the way towards Crete. So um, this is very much Erdogan's style. And at a time of great crisis within Turkey, where the Turkish currency, the lira, is collapsing, um, where Turkey is in deep recession, where unemployment is rising, where he has just uh, um, suffered a major setback, in municipal elections and has cancelled the election outcome in Istanbul, Turkey's largest city, which was won by the opposition and is trying to engineer that election all over again. And at a time when also his um, project in Syria is coming under increasing pressure with the Russians and the uh, Syrians closing in on Idlib, this, this enclave in Idlib province, which, uh, of which he has posed as the protector, what Erdogan is doing um, is he's pushing hard to assert Turkish interests as he sees them and the Turkish flag in this area um, around Cyprus so that he can pose, as he always does, to the Turkish electorate at a time when he is personally under great political pressure as the champion of Turkey and the champion of Turkish interests and as the man who's standing up for Turkey and who will assert Turkey's rights against everyone else. And it's important to stress that amongst the countries that Cyprus is, of course, uh, in partnership with in seeking to develop its um, interests, it, it, its natural resources. There is Israel, with which at the moment Erdogan has very bad relations. And of course, there are, as you correctly said, American companies when, and of course, Erdogan is quarreling with the United States. So all of this is coming together to create this conflict in uh, the Eastern Mediterranean. As is always the way with Erdogan, I don't think he will push it to the farthest point. But as is also the case with Erdogan, he is trying to back his demands with threats. So we see Turkish naval exercises going on in the Eastern Mediterranean. Talk of him protecting Turkish ships if they're interfered with whilst they carry out these drilling operations. And as you can explain to us and explain to our viewers, Cyprus has actually issued arrest warrants for the people on these Turkish ships because they are uh, um, infringing upon Cyprus's exclusive economic zone. So he's, in a sense, ratcheting up the tensions. I think he knows when to stop. He always seems to know when to stop in these conflicts. But the risk of a miscalculation is high. Yeah, Operation Seawolf uh, 2019 is the uh, military exercise that Turkey is now undertaking in the region. Let's see, a total of 131 warships, 57 warplanes, and 33 helicopters. It's a pretty big uh, deployment, is it not? Absolutely. For this part of the world, it is a very big deployment. Obviously, Turkey is not a military superpower, even though Erdogan would like us to think so at times. But... In the Eastern Mediterranean, this is a major show of force, and it is certainly one that is causing people in Cyprus, which has the experience of uh, uh, an invasion by Turkey, and which has Turkish military actually occupying the northern part of the island. It makes people there very nervous, as it does people in Greece. Yeah, you have about 30,000 uh, Turkish troops currently in the in the north, upwards of 30,000. And the Cypriot government, so the Cypriot government has decided to, to work on the diplomatic front. 
Um, they're engaging with the European Union. They're thinking about possible consequences, uh, maybe along the lines of uh, some sanctions. Um, nothing has been decided, of course. You mentioned that they were um, looking at the crew members of these ships. And uh, the, the problem with that is, is you know, trying to, to put restrictions and, and sanctioning uh, various crew members of these ships gets pretty, pretty difficult because you can just always switch the flag of this ship switch the crews in and out, and you kind of lose track as to what's going on. I mean, obviously, this, you know, this is pretty, there's a lot of money at stake here, and it's a pretty big operation that, that Turkey is undertaking. But Alexander, you mentioned that uh, Turkey is going against some some pretty big forces by doing this. And I'm trying to, I want to try to figure out Erdogan's motivation. Obviously, we t- talked about the U.S. Uh, French companies have a stake in this as well. Huge French, French company, Total. We mentioned, you mentioned Israel, Egypt, Greece. Why would Turkey do this? What, is this is this meant for internal, to, to help Erdogan internally more than it is to antagonize NATO, the United States, France, Israel, Egypt? Or is there an international component here? But I think, I think that to a great extent it is intended to help Erdogan in, internally. However... Um, it's important to say the tensions in this part of the Eastern Mediterranean between Greece and Turkey and Turkey and Cyprus have never gone away. I mean, I can remember way back in the 1970s sensitivities about Turkish ships uh, um, exploring for oil and gas in the Eastern Mediterranean along uh, uh, along the Cypriot coast and pe- people worrying about it even then. So this is a long-standing thing. And of course, he, he Erdogan, is tapping into a long-standing sense of grievance that many people in Turkey have, that because Greek islands are so close to Turkish, Turkey's coast coastline, uh, the Turkey is somehow being prevented from having the kind of economic zone in the neighboring seas that it should have, at least according to this theory. And that as a consequence of that, Turkey is not able to develop resources which it ought to be entitled to. I, I mean, I, I stress this is a Turkish argument. It's not one I share. But uh, I think that Erdogan has been dropping very heavy hints that he would allow uh, development in these waters of all of these resources, provided Turkey was given a cut in them. And of course, that's not something the Greeks and the Cypriots can agree to, because that would, in effect, amount to granting Turkey, conceding Turkey's uh, demands for essentially an extension of Turkey's uh, coastal shelf far beyond uh, um, the Greek islands uh, and far beyond Cyprus, as I said, in the direction of places like Crete. So I I think that this is part of the agenda that Erdogan is playing. And I think what he's basically saying to all of these various countries, to uh, the United States, to the US oil companies, to the French oil companies, to Israel, to Cyprus, to Greece, to Egypt, is that if you don't concede my demands, which, as I said, are unacceptable to Cyprus and Greece, these developments, this development of these resources won't happen at all. And I think that is a very dangerous thing because, of course, it puts Turkey in confrontation with all the other uh, uh, important players in the eastern Mediterranean. Now, the Anastasiadis government has moved Cyprus significantly um, westward. Mm. Uh, I would say maybe four or five years ago, Cyprus was uh, kind of split between Western Europe and Russia. And and you do have Mm. a very large Russian population here. Uh, Recent estimates say that it's around 60,000 Russians live in Cyprus all year round. Yes. Now, you know, Anastasiadis has moved it more towards the EU, more towards the United States, uh, cooperating with Israel. And ever since we did find the the gas and the oil reserves, you know, the U.S. has moved in. They've moved into the area and Exxon is now, you know, building a pretty significant presence here. How much of this do you think 
Russia is to blame. And I say that because <clears throat> you have the South Stream, the, the Turk Stream, which is going through Turkey, and Turkey is now kind of seeing itself, and Erdogan is seeing itself as, you know, an energy hub. You have the S-400 sale. You have the fact that Cyprus has, in, in, in all honesty, moved towards the U.S. and Western yeah. side of the equation. And so, you know, Russia may say, okay, it seems like we may have lost Cyprus for good now. We, we don't have as much influence as we used to have. Do you think, even though Russia has condemned this, do you think that Russia is kind of telling Erdogan, go ahead? No, I don't think so. I, I, I should say, say a few things. Firstly, and, absolutely- and can I also premise real quick, the thought came to my head, can I also premise that obviously this, this, this gas finding, and there is significant amounts mm. of, of natural gas and oil that they have found already, you could make the argument that it could put a dent, a small dent, mm. into Russia's position towards you know providing uh, gas and energy to Europe. Right. Uh, just to say, I don't think that the Russians are directly uh, in goading Erdogan on. Um, uh, that isn't very much their style of diplomacy, and I don't think they are. Now, a few things to say. Firstly, uh, there was a time, I can remember this, when Gazprom was actually interested in developing this, uh, 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 was also interested in getting involved in developing the uh, gas resources in this region, and they were in detailed discussions with the Israelis, and I believe with Cyprus, about doing so. But as you correctly say, Anastasiades has changed uh, um, um, Cyprus's political um, orientation, and Gazprom was basically pushed out, and the US and US companies have moved in. But I don't think Cyprus is as important to the Russians as it was five, ten years ago. Because just as the uh, Anastasiades government has moved uh, um, Cyprus back towards the EU and the US, the Russians, for their part, have become much more sceptical about the whole idea of allowing offshoring of their economy. And the whole uh, push from the Russian government is to get people in Russia who previously had companies in Cyprus to repatriate them back to Russia. And that has made that there is a cooling, if you like, in Russian interest in Cyprus. As I'm sure you remember, at the time of the 2013 banking crisis in Cyprus, there was some talk about um, the Cypriots offering a naval base to the Russians in Cyprus. And I can remember a Cypriot delegation coming to Moscow at that time to uh, afloat that idea. I don't know how seriously it was intended, but it was being talked about. And the Russians were completely cool about it, even then. So I don't think they were very keen on getting involved at that time in a geostrategic play with Cyprus in the Eastern Mediterranean. And I think they're even less so now when Cyprus is economically less important to them. Having said that, um, it's probably true to say that the Russians are less supportive of Cyprus and of Greece than they might have been a few years ago. And they are going to be very, very careful at a time like this when their relationship with Turkey and with Erdogan has become very strong not to antagonize him by taking too strong a pro-Greek or pro-Cypriot position um, um, in, in connection with this conflict. So I don't think they've, they've instigated this. I don't think they're egging Erdogan on. I don't think they are particularly sorry, if I have to be frank about it, that this has happened, which is a different, it's a, it's a sort of rather more subtle point not because I, I think they really want to hurt Cyprus, but because I think that they want to keep Erdogan and Turkey as distant from the West and with as many arguments with the West as they possibly can. Yeah, but can you also make the argument, I, I agree with you along those lines, can you also make the argument, and I mean, you kind of made in the beginning of the segment that, yes, a lot of this 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 posturing by Erdogan is more for internal consumption yeah. because 
you know, Turkey is definitely going through a very, very rough patch right now with the lira and, and everything that's going on internally in Turkey and as, as well as what's going on in Istanbul and, and the elections. Yes. Because, you know, people in Istanbul are furious as, yes. as to what's happening. And, and rightly so. I mean, Erdogan is rigging the elections. I mean, that's that's the way I look at it. He is. Uh, I have no doubt about that. Yeah, people all, are absolutely. in the streets. People may not know that who are watching this video, but I'm sure a lot of Turkish people that do follow the Duran know that people are in the streets absolutely. in Istanbul and they're upset. And uh, <laughs> Mishkin is <laughs> Mishkin's happy uh, though. Yes, he certainly is. I mean, he's a uh, He's, he's very delighted to join us on a program with the Duran. Right. We have to talk about serious subjects now, Mishkin. So in a moment, in a moment. OK, so, but, uh, so yeah. can, can you make the argument that externally, this, the South Stream pipeline, the S-400s, and the fact that Russia has place so much value on Turkey is giving Erdogan the impetus to say, you know what, let me see if I can get some more, if I can parlay this this energy hub kind of mentality that he's getting and parlay that into a piece of this energy find in the Mediterranean right. as well. Right. I mean, th 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 you know, let me take let me take 10 steps forward and see if I can just get, you know, one or two and if I can take those 10 steps and make them two steps forward. This is, I mean, right. I, I think this is actually very likely because, of course, the point about Erdogan is that he is extremely skilled at leveraging his advantages in order to get more advantages out of his various erstwhile friends and partners and sometimes his enemies also. Now, at this moment in time, he has very bad relations with the United States. He has very bad relations with um, Israel. Um, and with the EU and with the Western powers in general. He is also uh, positioning Turkey to become an energy hub, as you correctly say. And he also wants, I think, to remind the Russians at this time that Turkey is coming under tremendous pressure from uh, the US. This is playing a significant role in undermining the Turkish economy um, because Turkey is pressing ahead with Turkstream and with the S-400 sale and is so obviously and so clearly involved with Russia. So I think what he is saying to the Russians is, look, you have to back me in this situation because realistically, if, any, if there's a crisis in Turkey or your partnership, your relations with Turkey um, are going to be jeopardized and you've invested now very heavily in building up this relationship with Turkey, and that means this relationship with me. So, at one and the same time, he is using that, probably, he's telling all that to the Russians to say, look, uh, uh, support me to the extent that you can over this business in the Eastern Mediterranean. At the same time, he's probably also telling the Russians, look, the problems in the Eastern Mediterranean are another sign of how bad my relations with the Western powers have become. And last but not least, he is going to make the Russians very concerned about the situation. And though I think that they are not keen to see Erdogan getting into a quarrel with Cyprus and Greece, they will probably, as I said, soft pedal uh, um, opposition to him to the extent that they might have once had and will probably try to help him in some ways. And that might be by making more economic concessions. We shall see. I mean, one thing that he seems to be holding out for, for example, with the Russians, is I think he wants more help developing Turkey's nuclear power uh, industries, <laughs> which the Russians can certainly help him with. And I think he's also uh, uh, going to hold out for a good deal on Russian military aircraft to replace the F-35 contract, which is about to fail. So um, there could be quite a lot of trading going on between Erdogan and the Russians over all of these subjects. And it's entirely possible that, this is, uh, that these events in the Eastern Mediterranean are part of that larger play. All right, finally, Alexander, let's look at uh, the Cyprus side of the equation. What can the, what can the Cypriot government do 
to diffuse mm. the situation? What can they do to send the message to Turkey that it is violating maritime and international law? And, uh, you know, my honest take on this is while the EU can talk about, you know, sanctioning and stuff like that, I don't think Turkey particularly gives a crap about what the EU is going to no. do. And while it's nice to think of, you know, the United States, you know, the, the, the most powerful superpower, you know, saying, you know, we've got your back Cyprus. If there's one thing I've always learned, it's that when push comes to shove, the United States will always, always go on the side of Turkey. Yes. And the UK obviously is on mm -hmm. the side of Turkey. So yes. was Cyprus being such a small country and Greece, which does mm -hmm. have a very powerful military and an exceptionally good, if not one of the best air forces in the world. Yeah. You know, Greece has been gutted for the past 10 years with the mm -hmm. austerity and the financial uh, situation that we all know about. What can Cyprus do? Well, indeed, what can Cyprus do? I mean, the first thing to say is I don't think they should try to defuse this crisis in some ways. I think they need to make it absolutely clear that this kind of Turkish behaviour is completely unacceptable and actually talk the, talk the crisis up, because that is the only way, realistically, they're going to have any dent on this call, thing. Call Erdogan's bluff, uh -huh. you mean? Absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I, I think that they should take as confrontational a line as possible because realistically, what else can they do? I mean, if if they try and soft talk with Erdogan, that isn't going to help. Whereas if they escalate this crisis to the extent that they can, that might be the way to get the great powers interested and actually get take steps to try and get uh, Erdogan to back off. Now, Cyprus is it, not... It, explain without... that real real quick, Alex, because yeah, that's, I mean, pretty yeah. controver that's a very controversial that's a viewpoint. Controver it's and a very, it even has it's... me worried. Yeah, I know, absolutely. Because... I, mean, I, I, do, I, don't, I don't mean, and I want to make this absolutely clear, I don't mean taking military action or threatening military action. I mean going around European capitals saying this is completely unacceptable behaviour, that this is totally inappropriate that, uh, that the EU, which, and remember, let's remember, Cyprus is a member of the EU, must back uh, Cyprus in this uh, situation. And I think using all the influence, extensive influence, that Cyprus, well, maybe not so extensive, but whatever influence Cyprus does have in the US to try and lobby hard in its national interests. In other words, not trying to downplay what is happening with what the Turks are doing, but also to try to talk it up, in effect. Now, um, can I remind you of something, which of course we haven't mentioned on this programme, that George Papadopoulos, remember him, the Donald Trump aide who was involved in the Russiagate scandal. I mean, he was somebody who was in fact involved to some extent in setting up all these energy projects um, in and around Cyprus. And he was on first terms with first name terms with President Anastasiades, also he says, over this sort of thing. Now, he's obviously not an influential person, but there is a genuine interest in this subject, but on the part of conservative people in the United States, and of course Israel also, which has extensive interests in the United States. So I'm talking about you know, engaging in a major diplomatic play. I think that is what Cyprus should try to do. However, being realistic about this, and if we come back to what you are saying before, whatever the EU and whatever the United States may think of this, I don't think they have any particular desire to come to Cyprus's rescue at this time. And as you correctly say, Britain, for reasons which are incomprehensible to me, is frankly hostile to Cyprus and supports Turkey, which is its traditional policy. That is why we have all of this thing about contested uh, uh, um, seas, which is, which is nonsense. But having said that, if you ask me what I think Cyprus should do, I think Cyprus should make as big a noise about this as it can 
whilst being completely realistic that at the moment um, there isn't very much they can do. D- does, does this all does this all make sense? Yeah, I mean it's a, just an extremely tough situation when very you have a tough. country of of not even a million in population. You know, and just a, a few miles yeah. up to the north, you have you know these huge, 000. you know Turkey, eighty million, you know population Eight. strong, which is making claims on on your waters. So with, with thirty thousand troops, with thirty thousand troops national, just right across on your, the yeah. uh, on your own national territory. Now, obviously, it is it is a problem, but I mean, you know, so, so Cyprus is not without friends. As so, so it's got Israel on side, it's got the the uh, people. Uh, uh, um, th- there are people in the United States in the energy industry who are also on site. Uh, as I said, it should use all the influence it has, especially at a time when relations between the United States and, and Turkey are very bad. Um, one should not over over have oh, you know over expect um, that you know think that it's got stronger cards. Cyprus has stronger cards than it has. But it's a mistake to say that Cyprus has no cards, and I think it should play them. I think that seeking to defuse this crisis is, is in a sense, um, appeasing Erdogan, who will simply push harder later when it suits him more, because that's what he does. Yeah, and, and if anything, to me, this is a clear signal um, that, the Cyprus problem needs to get resolved. In other words, oh, the occupied North and the and the recognized South, the the recognized government, they need to come to a solution to unify the island again, so that you do not have, you know, Turkey interfering, or Greece interfering, or the UK interfering. You know, Cyprus well, it- needs to to figure this out on its own, so it needs to come to a solution ASAP. Otherwise. You know, Erdogan, no. this is not the, the, the last time we're going to see Erdogan, no. you know, making his claims on. Uh, 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 what you're saying is absolutely correct, because obviously if, if Cyprus is a united island, which it should be, then these kind of maneuvers that Erdogan is engaging in would not be possible. It is precisely because the island is divided in this way with 30,000 Turkish troops on its northern territories that it finds itself exposed to this sort of action. Um, But I come back to what I was saying. Certainly Cyprus needs to make a serious effort to try to achieve unification. That may mean that some people in uh, Cyprus um, um, have to accept certain things which they might not wish to accept. I mean, they may not be able to get a solution that is a solution that everybody in, uh, um, if you like, recognized Greek speaking Cyprus is going to be fully happy with. But if they don't, they have to face the prospect of more things like this happening in future. I come back though to the point I made. If you're going to push for a negotiation, especially when you're dealing with someone like Erdogan, a negotiation intended to reunify the island, you have to speak not just with a united voice, but with a clear one. And you've got to be very clear about what kind of action by Turkey is acceptable and what is not. And you have to make it very clear to all the players uh, what your message is. And you have to play all your cards skillfully and well and know what your cards are. And I have to be straightforward about this. I don't think Cyprus and I don't think Greece also has always done that very well. Yeah, this is a time where you need very, very skilled diplomacy. We absolutely Absolutely. I think we do have, I do think Cyprus and Greece have cards to play. They've not always played them very well. And I'm going to say this frankly, I mean, you know, uh, 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 I think Anastasiades is is an effective uh, and skillful president. I look at the situation in Greece with Mr. Tsipras in charge, and I can't say the same there. Yeah, well... Mm. (laughs) <laughs> I'm not going to argue with you. I'm not going to argue with you on that one. But uh, well, let's see how this uh, story plays out. And mm-hmm. uh, I, I agree with you. I think that 
the Cyprus, uh, the status quo right now leaves Cyprus very, very vulnerable hmm. to the whims of, of someone like Erdogan. And, yes, uh, a very volatile uh, uh, individual yeah. who, who, who bluffs and gambles very hard and whose position in Turkey is becoming unstable. And such an individual is not someone I'm afraid you can treat lightly. Because though, as I said, I don't think he has any serious intentions of starting a conflict in the Eastern Mediterranean. It's very easy with him to see how things could run out of control. And that's always the danger when you're dealing with a person like that. Yeah, I agree. Alexander Curse, Editor-in-Chief of the Duran. Thank you very much. Guys, if you like this video, click on the subscribe button down below. Click on that notifications bell to get notifications every time we push out a new video. Visit the Duran shop, pick up a polo shirt like the one Alexander is wearing, or of course that mug that he just flashed in front of you as well, the Duran mug. It really helps us out a lot. And of course, you can donate to us on PayPal and Patreon. The links are in the description box down below. And get an audio copy of this video. Follow us on iTunes and on SoundCloud as well. And you can also follow us on Instagram, the Duran underscore Cobb. And of course, download the Blank Chat app to stay in touch with us as well. The links are in the description as well. And don't forget, go to the Duran.com and see all the articles that Alexander is looking up to every day. Alexander Merkurs, editor-in-chief of the Duran. Thank you. Until next time, everybody, take care.